All righty. Welcome back to the Critique Through History. Today, I'm going to be covering probably one of the most important periods of Earth's history, and yet one that no one wants to talk about for very embarrassing reasons for academics. So I'm coming in hot today. The mid-Triassic isn't really the middle of the Triassic. It's this bizarre little period that exists kind of in between the Upper Triassic and Lower Triassic. And what do I mean by that? So if you actually look at, let's take a look here, um, you'll see that the Middle Triassic just covers this 10 million years uh, between when the Triassic first starts. And like I covered last time, if you want to go back and revisit the stream from, uh, what was it, two months ago where I initially started the Triassic critique, yeah, sorry about that. I just have a bunch of life going on at the moment. You'll see that the Lower Triassic represents a time of intense transition and intense calamity. There's the in-Permian mass extinction event, which we see from the geological record, and then a second less intense mass extinction that occurs just five million years later, or maybe two or three million years later. So this time period, 247 million years, is about the time where we think plants have fully recovered from or forests rather have completely recovered from the mass extinction. And we don't see, like if you look over here at this, we see early vascular plants appear about 410 million years ago. So this time period that we see, um, we see vascular plants appear, we see seed plants appear, and then, but we don't see flowering plants 130 million years ago. So ferns, cycads, conifers, things of that nature are the dominant plants. So when I, when I say like the forests have recovered, uh, that's kind of like what I'm talking about here. So if we go here, this is a Britannica site. Um, we've already covered the beginning of this period. What I want to talk about now is all of the miraculous stuff that, that occurs in the 10 million years of the mid-Triassic uh, that is completely inexplicable to modern day science. And here I've pulled up a couple of things I want to talk about. It's 10 million, 10 million years, so there isn't a huge amount to really cover. In fact, I'm kind of debating whether or not I want to um, re-release this as a standalone video on the mid-Triassic because it's probably not going to be that long of a stream um, unless you know people come in and want to talk about other stuff or go into deeper detail. So I'm just going to give a short uh, rundown of some of the stuff that happened in the mid-Triassic that is not being explained by science. So we covered the extinction last time. Um, I, th I think that like invertebrates, although fascinating, there is one type of invertebrate I do want to talk about um, before I get to my more serious topic. So one of the cool things to start off with, what people need to keep in mind, last time I talked about the origins of the dinosaurs. Uh, during this time period, we see the Avametatosalians come about 240 million years ago. Yet, I need to keep in mind that during this time, there was a lot going on. So one of the first things I want to kind of cover is that corals. I think this might have covered it. Let me, let me see if this has uh, the reference. Yeah. So here we see the Triassic period marked the beginning of major changes that were to take place throughout the Mesozoic era, particularly the distribution of continents. So remember, all of the uh, land masses are theoretically part of this land mass called Pangaea. So this is uh, 237 million years ago. So this is uh, about 10 million years before. So it, it's still basically still Pangaea. Uh, at the beginning of the Triassic, all the virtual, all the major land masses were collected to the supercontinent of Pangaea, which just means like all lands. They say, again, I went through last time, um, to, uh, the assumptions that they made about the climate of Pangaea, but this is what I want to get into. So on the margins of the continents, shallow seas, which had dwindled in area at the end of the Permian, became more extensive as sea levels gradually rose. The waters of the continental shelves were colonized for the first time by large marine reptiles and reef building corals of modern aspect. This is almost glossed over. Where did these corals come from? Reef building corals of modern aspect. So the corals we see today emerged in the middle Triassic and we don't know where they come from. One of the biggest mysteries in all of science, and it's just a quip. Where did modern corals come from? They just suddenly appeared. So if you go to this article here, Evolution of Modern Corals and Their Early History, uh, this is by George D. Stanley Jr. So uh, Scleractinians, 
uh, are a group of, of calcified um, anthozoan corals, many of which populate shallow water and tropical to subtropical reefs. Most of these corals calcify rapidly and their success on reefs is related to symbiotic association with zooxanthellae. So that's just a species of algae. These one-celled allergal symbiotes live in the endodermal tissues of the coral host and are thought responsible for moaning rapid calcification. The evolutionary significance of the symbiosis and the implications it holds for explaining the success of corals is of paramount importance. Scalactinia stands out as one of the few orders of calcified metazoans that arose in the Triassic time, along after a greater proliferation of calcified metazoan orders in the Paleozoic. The origin of this coral group, so important to reefs today, has remained an unsolved problem in paleontology. The idea that Scleractinia evolved from older Paleozoic rugose corals that somehow survived the Permian mass extinction persists among some schools of thought, which doesn't make any sense because the seas were hit the hardest and corals are some of the most, and even at this time, those Paleozoic rugose corals were some of the most sensitive life forms and we don't see them represented in the modern day. So they died out. We don't know how they survived, but modern day corals just appeared out of thin air um, during the during the mid-Triassic. Paleozoic scler um, scleractinia morphs have also been presented as possible ancestors. So here we see the paleontolog paleontological record shows the first appearance of fossils currently classified in the order um, scleractinia to be in the middle Triassic. So remember, this is uh, 247 to 257 million years ago, and corals really haven't changed much ever since. They've diversified, but base, physiologically, uh, base, base physiology has not changed in corals. So keep that in mind. Um, what we see here, so what we see here, these early scleractinia provide a picture of unexpectedly robust taxonomic diversity and high colony integration. So right off the bat, these corals, which appeared from thin air from unknown ancestors, are incredibly diverse. So they already have incredible diversity. They're already incredibly uh, versatile in terms of their morphology and where they are at. It's not like we just have like little proto coral and then a bunch of coral. It's just like we have no coral and then suddenly a bunch of coral just literally out of thin air. So results from molecular biology support a polyphyletic evolution for living scleractinia and the molecular clock. So polyphyletic that just means many branches calibrated against the fossil record suggests that two major groups of ancestors could extend back to late Paleozoic time. No, Paleozoic, Pale late Paleozoic time. So they are assuming that there's two major groups of ancestors that survived the Paleozoic. The issue I have with this, and I'm going to just say it now, is there's no evidence that any corals survived the, Pale the, the in Permian mass extinction. So it's assumed because 90 to 95% of all sea life died, these early corals, these Paleozoic corals that are only convergently similar to modern corals, they all died out. I mean, they, they are obliterated from the fossil record. They, they did not appear for millions upon millions of years. And they're assuming that there's some ghost lineage of corals, but they're just assuming that um, these, these calcifying anthozoan, whatever, like these uh, Nidarians that they're assuming are, or they're not, they're not even sure they're Nidarian, they're just metazoans, uh, just animals. They know they're not plants or fungus, but they they don't have any proof whatsoever that they descend from corals. And there is no clear evidence. Even molecular studies aren't really determining. They think like, oh, maybe corals are ancient. Where did they survive? But what we do know is that they and their symbiosis and their calcification, all of that it all appeared rapidly within, remember, 10 million years. 10 million years is, to keep in mind, less time than it took gorillas and chimps to diverge. It's it's a similar time window to the how long it took the felids and the panterans um, to diverge and their common ancestors. So 10 million years, biologically speaking, according to all the animals we see, and I've covered this before, 10 million years in a macroevolutionary sense, the amount of mutations that have to accumulate even if you assume macroevolution is the correct principle behind the changing life that we see throughout the fossil record, it's not long enough to explain much. And again, when I talked about how we went from basically lungfish to fully terrestrial uh, amphibians in just 10, 15 million years, when I talked about that, and I've had people be like, oh, well, 15 million years is long enough for this to happen. 
I have to keep reminding people over and over again that natural selection and open niches are not the catalyst for macroevolution. There is a misunderstanding of macroevolution where the main driving force is natural selection and open niches and available food sources, and it's not. The driving force for evolution, macroevolution, which is not the same as microevolution, that's changing allele frequencies. Macroevolution is the creation of new alleles through mutation. That process is driven by mutation. An animal's base mutation rate, the probability that somewhere in their germ cell line, they're going to have some sort of gene copying error that results in a changing of their fundamental base genome and the expression of traits, that likelihood is fairly consistently low across all lineages of modern observed animals. Even the fastest evolving animals, quote unquote, like cichlids or some invertebrates or microbes, they still, and the Richard Linsky experiments back in the 80s, the modern day prove this, that they're not changing at a rate fast enough to explain the phenomena occurring in the fossil record. And a perfect example of this is with not only just corals, but um, some animals I'll, I'll cover later, but corals especially came out of the thin air. They came out of the ether. One moment they're, they're not there, one moment they're there. And it's not like this is a long drawn out process like they're um, gonna say happen with Ave Metatarsalians with no evidence. No, this is just a snap of the fingers. We, we didn't have corals before, now we do in the, in the rock layers. So this is what happened. Um, the idea that Scleractinia were to uh, derive from soft bodied anemia like ancestors that survived the Permian mass extinction has become widely uh, a widely considered hypothesis, but one with no evidence. So the hypothesis is that they emerged from soft bodied anemone like ancestors. But where are they? Because when we look at the rock layer of these late Permian, early Triassic seas, it is a hellscape. When they, when we talk about 70% of all genera going extinct, I, I, we, it, it is a absolute cataclysm. The in Permian mass extinction event was the worst mass extinction in Earth's history, and the seas were most affected at all, of, of all. And there is no evidence of these soft-bodied anemone-like ancestors because most soft-bodied organisms, unless they leave impressions, or some sort of trace fossils are typically not um, mineralized and recorded in the fossil record. So they have this little convenient out that they just assume like, oh, this soft bodied creature that leaves uh, no trace of this existence must be the uh, ancestor. And that's what they, they call it a hypothesis, not a theory. Like there's no actual scientific backing for the origin of corals. They just assume it came from some soft bodied anemone, which conveniently wouldn't leave any ancestors. The 14 million year Mesozoic coral gap stands as a fundamental obstacle to, for the verification of many of these, these ideas. However, this obstacle is not a barrier for the derivation of scleractinians from anemone-like soft-bodied ancestors. No, the obstacle is uh, the fact that you have no evidence for this hypothesis. The hypothesis of the ephemeral naked coral presents the greatest potential solution for the enigma of orb of scleractinians. It states that different groups of soft-bodied unrelated anemone-like um, anthozoans gave rise to various calcified scleractinian-like corals through um, aragonitic biomineralization. Although there's evidence for this phenomenon being more universal uh, in the mid-Triassic interval following lengthy early Triassic post-extinction perturbation. So in fancy pants talk, they think that a bunch of different types of uh, coral-like ancestors, because they found that two ancestral lineages lead to modern corals. And they think that this is some sort of universal constant among these colony building organisms that somehow endosymbiosis and the process of rediversification and uh, kind of getting back on their sea legs, so to speak, after the uh, in Permian mass extinction event would somehow help them. But remember last time we talked about how just two to three million years after the in Permian, there was another mass extinction or another extinction event right there, right there in the Permian. Again, really drastically hitting sea life. We wouldn't even see large marine organisms really come back until the mid Triassic. Remember, this is the period where forests recover, where the seas seem to recover. But then these corals come out of nowhere and molecular studies don't ever point them to one specific ancestor. So this idea of modification and descent leading to these drastic changes and radiations of animals over time, over millions of years, is contradicted. Because looking at the molecular studies of corals show that it's polyphyletic, that it's not just like they descend from one common ancestor and we can trace it back. It's, pure, it's pretty and it's concise. No. Even with molecular studies, which they, they in themselves are not conclusive because they say that hippos and whales are, are their closest relatives, but 
with really, really shaky fossil evidence to back that up. Um, but that's something I'll get to way down the line when I get to the Paleocene and Eocene. But it's, it's even more cut and dry with corals that there is no clear common ancestor for corals. There is no clear like aha gotcha moment in the fossil record where you have a clear indication that this is the origin of uh, corals in general, especially these biomineralizing scleractinian corals that we see even in the modern day. They emerged and through every other mass extinction event and extinction event on Earth that's happened since, they've survived. So corals have been around for about 245 million years, which is incredible to think about because ever since they've changed very, very little. So they, they underwent this incredible physiological change and then just haven't changed since for some reason. So again, it's like in their early history, they're assumed to have gone through these radical changes, but then suddenly aren't able to go through them anymore. So it appears to have occurred at least three other times prior to this interval. Uh, this is the idea that, uh, comes from these rugose paleozoic corals, by the way. Uh, the idea suggests that because of ephemeral characteristics, which means short-lived characteristics like soft bodies, the skeleton does not represent a clade of zoanthrin evolution. Let me repronounce that. A clade of zoanthrian evolution, but instead represents a grade of organization. So they think that the, the way that corals build themselves up is not an indication of morphology, but instead an indication of how they organize themselves morphologically based on physics, which again, does not have any, I mean, you could, it's funny because that same logic, you apply it to animals and they kvetch and they seethe and they, they don't want to say like, oh yeah, the ankle morphology and biomolecular studies. Yeah. I mean, this, this is the same argument you could make for building of DNA that just because DNA is similar doesn't mean that it, it implies that these two animals are descended from a common ancestor. It could mean that there could be converges, convergences in terms of traits, which is something that um, can be presented when it comes to bilaterians and regulatory genes. Do, do having similar regulatory genes that, you know, say a head goes on one end and a tail goes on the other proof of descent from one bilaterian ancestor, or is it just a sign that most life, especially life on earth will assume sort of the same sort of genetic constructs to achieve the same goal if they're all using the same tools. It's, it's, I mean, then they say it's so fundamental, but how many times have bows and arrows or iron or stoneworking or wheels been independently invented across human history? I mean, if you have the same tools and you have the same items, like atlatl darts have been invented by every single paleolithic people independent of one another, Every time we look at it from North America to Africa, to Eurasia, to Australia, we see atlatls appear. Does that, I mean, atlatls are some of the earliest human technologies we see. And yet we, we assume that, oh yeah, it's, it totally makes sense. The simpler and more fundamental the construct in nature, the more likely it is to convergently appear. I mean, partially retractable claws, uh, canine teeth. I mean, you can look at all kinds of lineages and all kinds of physiological aspects to animals, even within things that people think are so, um, so set in stone, like things like dentition, things like uh, auditory surfaces, certain aspects of the skeletal morphology. And you'll find both exceptions to the rule and convergences that break the rule in almost every other lineage, which is why modern scientists move away from the morphological species concept towards the either biological or phylogenetic species concept, but just comparing animals based on their morphology doesn't get you anywhere. So in the fossil record, skeletons may have appeared and disappeared at different times as some clades reverted to soft bodied existence. So they say that the appearance and disappearance of these animals can be, just be explained away for the fact that they, that they de-evolve back to being soft bodied. So this is what they say can account for the gaps in the taxonomic and fossil record for corals. So with zero evidence that the same thing they accuse people like me, people who critique them of doing, they just kind of like blow smoke out of their ass with zero evidence and cover up holes in their logic, holes in their evolutionary bull crap by just saying, oh, they must have reverted to a soft bodied state. And that's why you didn't see them, which is just the worst cop out possible. Fuller understanding a possible solution to the problem, the origin of corals may be forthcoming, 
However, it will require synthesis of diverse kinds of data and integration of findings from paleobiology, stratigraphy, bio molecular biology, carbonate, geochemistry, biochemistry. They just need proof. They just need proof. What, what, what they're looking for is proof. Source. You know, like the old old the old plebit adage of uh, source please uh, can i get a source please source this is just this this is just wishful thinking it's i think the coral example something i stumbled upon with the mid triassic something i had to start with was so i think it's so vital for understanding just how how important it is to really take these people not as lab coats, not as professors or PhDs, take them at their word. Look at what they're saying. They're basically trying to BS you right to your face by saying, oh, we don't need evidence. Just, believe, you know, these, these corals, oh, they must've just reverted back. Like, but they don't have any evidence. So when in the absence of evidence, instead of just saying, we don't know, and that this defy, it's like, there's so many loopholes and so many examples of where macroevolutionary principles in the fossil record just don't work out where there's obvious problems with your theory of common descent of all organisms, where there's problems with your theory that uh, modification with descent is the way that everything came about and that everything's randomly organized. You get confronted with situations like this, which don't have clear cut answers where even their fancy pants molecular studies don't derive a common ancestor. And they're kind of just left holding the bag and having to not make themselves look stupid by saying, Oh, well, it, it, well, they probably just reverted to soft body forms. All of this cope just to preserve an outdated principle that is continuously and from here on out will, will still continuously be ripped to shreds time and time again by their own lack of data and their own baseless assumptions purely to promote their own dogma and ideology. This cult of materialism, this, this church of evolution is not based in science. And I need people to really understand that. I mean, coming out the cuts, um, just, just to, just to publish this, I mean, just experiences that I had, the fact that, you know, summer's kicking off and people are posting new stuff relating to science, relating to fossil finds. And I keep hearing the same garbage pushed over and over again when it comes to macroevolution. And they act like this is just watertight. Like I'm so sick of people acting like macroevolution is watertight when you have things like coral, Th things that people take for granted with no clear actual origins. And speaking of, I'm going to move on to our, our next example, and that's the, the origin of frogs. So modern frogs, modern frogs, as we know them fully, like modern frogs, like modern frogs, uh, they also sort of had their uh, heyday in the mid-Triassic. I mean, just ostensibly modern frogs and lizards appearing in the triassic and again never going extinct and even though they would radiate and assume all kinds of different forms and sizes they're modern so just like how we say anatomically modern humans appeared 250,000 years ago or you could say like maybe 200,000 even when no matter how conservative you put it 245 million years ago or 240 million years ago is basically the consensus for truly modern frogs. And, and they say over 200 million years ago, um, it's the mid Triassic. So, so the earliest equatorial record from frogs from late Triassic of Arizona, but we see these frogs, it's the middle Triassic that really sees frogs come to the fore and where they came from. It used to be that they, we thought they were um, from Tim and But again, we see another juicy, chronological gap. So if we look at control F, uh, a neuro, I don't know if it covers this, but anyway, see this is why I got to do your own little research guys. So we see here, so we see the frogs appear in this area. So Many components of living vertebrae fauna originated as small bodied clades in the Triassic period, including the first records of mammaliforms, squamates, turtles, crocodilomorphs, dinosaurs, and lysamphibians. So, squamates are lizards and snakes. You know, lizards and skates are called squamates for their scales. Turtles, which I already covered turtles and their whole, uh, the number of holes in your skull de de determines your lineage. Like, uh, we're related to all synapsids, even though it's clear looking at turtles, which are anapsid, 
they assume that they're derived from diapsid. So they can change these holes in their skulls and the holes in the skull aren't indicative of their ancestry because they're now grouped as not as anapsids, not as parareptiles, but as true reptiles. But the same doesn't work for synapsids. So you can't be a derivational synapsid. All synapsids had to have a common origin. So remember, monkeys come from lizards and that's and lizards come from fish. That's that's what they want you to believe. Uh, even though turtles, like I mentioned in my earlier streams on turtles, kind of break that down. But modern turtles, modern turtles, modern lizards, uh, the cynodonts. Um, so they don't think like the, the old, what, like true mammals. They're not going to put their necks out that far and say true mammals. They're going to say mammalia forms like cynodonts. Um, crocodilomorphs, so not true crocodiles, but oh, they look like crocodiles. And then the dinosaurs. Uh, so abemetatarsalians is kind of like, what I'm going to cover for these two groups, these argosaurs, and then the list amphibians. So some of these clades uh, originate in the early Triassic, but are remained extremely rare. Uh, with their next appearances in the fossil record in the Jurassic. So we see these creatures, we see these vast ghost lineages in the fossil record, where they seemingly disappear for millions upon millions of years, and then just miraculously come back to the fossil record. And uh, they don't really have an explanation for that either. So chronological gaps in the records of many taxa are a major problem for recognizing morphological and functional transformations in these groups. So what they mean by recognizing morphological and functional transformations in these groups, it's a major problem in terms of trying to fit it within a macroevolutionist narrative. So the reason that this is a problem isn't because they're there one moment and gone the next. It's a problem because they can't just cleanly place it within a macroevolutionary model and then make it work out. Again, they think about the fossil record, not from an objective point of view, but from an evolutionist point of view. Their entire shtick, everything these people do is to justify their religion. Everything these people do is to justify their dogma. They're not here to explain genuinely what the origins of life are. They're only here to make sure that everything they find fits neatly into their little narrative. So this is why this is a problem. It's like, oh, we see these, what we assume to be these early animals appear and then they disappear. So we think they emerge in the Jurassic. Oh, but then we find these early finds in the Triassic and now we're left scratching our heads because we assume that they were only this much old. And then we find older specimens and it throws out all of our evolutionist BS. And we have to like retcon all of this information because we assumed that we, we made this beautiful little systematic model of macroevolution and told everybody, oh, this they emerged in the Jurassic and da-da-da-da-da. And then we find specimens perfectly analogous even to modern specimens. And they and they and they and they just cope. It's it's the same people who try to say, like, oh well, uh th well, they first try to claim Odonata or the Anisopterans, whatever, the dragonflies only appeared in the Triassic or something, and they only appeared in in uh, or in the late Permian or the early Triassic, we see the first true dragonflies and then they find mega neurons and they find dragonflies from the Carboniferous. And then their argument is, oh, those aren't true dragonflies. They're, 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 they're related. It's just converted. And it's all a bunch of cope because they, they're confronted with specimens older than what they assumed. And now they have to retcon all of the stuff and all the bull crap they've been saying. It's like climate change. Every time they're proven wrong, they have to retcon everything in order to keep their legitimacy. And this especially applies for these groups. Furthermore, a more accurate understanding of this diversity is hampered in the Triassic terrestrial small body tetrapods are best known from high paleo altitudes, specifically Eastern North America and Europe. However, small body tetrapods should also be present in equatorially sourced Triassic rocks to the Southwestern USA. Research in the past 20 years has significantly increased the sample diversity of small body tetrapods from the Chinle formation aided by methods such as screen washing and that work is key. So they're, they're trying their best to, to piece things together and I respect them. That's what actual science is. But what we see here, what we see here is that there, so the next oldest record ends in approximately 60 million year old gap in the frog fossil record. But what we do see is that frogs come out of no nowhere. So most time color body suggests yes, the crown group of neurons originating in the late Triassic, but no fossils correspond to this important interval for a neuron evolution. What this means is that the actual origin of frogs as we see them today is completely unknown. Again, these macro evolutionists, these people who say that all animals descend from shape-shifting ancestors don't know where frogs come from. Modern frogs appeared out of thin air in the fossil record, and we don't know where they came from. 
We don't know what they descend from. We don't know who their ancestors actually are. And the same mystery presents itself with turtles, who they say descend from ancestors that within one generation flip their rib cage inside out. So it's, it's, it's like every time you think that, oh, the, every time you go to a period of history and you think, oh man, um, uh, it's, it's just 10 million years. Like, what's the big deal? Um, this 10 million years is full of nothing but holes for science. The Triassic is a messy time period. Scientists do not like talking about the Triassic period. And the reason is, is because it pokes nothing but holes in all of their macroevolutionist dogma. So we go on from here. Here, we partially fill this chronological gap by describing the earliest um, Salentian material from the equatorial regions of Pangaea and Upper Triassic. Lithostratigraphic correlation of primary specimen to dated horizon suggests a maximum depositional age between 217 and approximately 213 million years ago. So that's a tad later. So, so I, this is definitely late Triassic or upper Triassic, but I'm covering it because they're claiming their origins are in the middle Triassic, that they have to be in the middle Triassic, that the supposed frog ancestor existed in the middle Triassic, and that these crowned group of frogs emerged and then have not significantly changed physiologically as to not make them crowned group of frogs ever since. So for over 200 million years, frogs have remained exactly the same, almost exactly the same morphologically, Besides variations in proportions, they have remained virtually the same. In fact, many of the time, they're like like the um, uh, late Cretaceous Budios from Madagascar. I mean, you're looking at frogs that even look similar to modern frogs and in all their different iterations. It's crazy to see that frogs filled similar niches using similar forms basically for over 200 million years. And... Even though we see mass radiations of frogs, especially after the extinction of dinosaurs, I mean, this calls this this basically points out all the different physiological characteristics that make them modern neurons. So we we have pretty definitive proof morphologically that these are crown group of neurons. That, that means that they are the the frogs that all modern frogs descend from, and yet they miraculously appear in the fossil record in the late Triassic, supposedly from some some mid Triassic ancestor that we don't have proof of. And they're found globally. So they appear all over the planet, all of a sudden. So here they are, all over the planet, all of a sudden. There's our, our early uh, Jurassic froggy from the Kenyatta formation. So in these two locations, we see the Viralia in South America, and these are contemporaries. But then we see all of these earlier Triassic so this is in the in the late Triassic, getting really close to the middle Triassic, three different specimens, again, global distribution. Where did they come from? Where did they go? Where did they come from? Cotton Eye Joe? Nobody knows. So again, macroevolutionists have, have, have contracted, okay, it's, it's Pangaea. Okay, well, we, we saw the for Pangaea, but where did it actually come from? They're, they're nowhere, and then they're everywhere. And then they're early, found everywhere earlier than we thought. And yet, where did they come from? What, what's their ancestor? What magical anamorph shape-shifting did they go through to get to this form? Nobody knows. One of life's greatest mysteries. So we go there, and we're moving on. We're moving on to the Abbe Metatarsalians. I mean, you think we're done about, you know, dealing with mysterious origins for animals. Uh, but there's one thing before I get to the Abbe Metatarsalians, because that's going to actually be more of the upper triassic i've been teasing the origin of dinosaurs for a long time but we're not even there yet i mean this is middle triassic dinosaurs aren't even on the scene the dominant animals of this time are not dinosaurs they're synapsids and another mystery again not just the origins of life but also the origin of extinction has to be considered because even though people act like this is some sort of extinction debt or something, but th there's a final turnover that doesn't include a mass extinction or radical climate change with no known origins, again, that sea dinosaurs be suddenly become dominant in their ecosystem in the late Triassic, as composed to the synapses that came before them, the um, dicynodonts and the sign uh, and the cynodonts that are, are the mammaliforms that they say are, are, are true mammals are descended from. 
from the Jura uh, from the Jurassic period, and then you have uh, the Therocephalians, which I'll get into in a minute. But on the land are represented by uh, represented in the Triassic by labyrinthodont amphibians and reptiles, and so we see like all these different types of uh, interesting reptiles that just again also went extinct during the Triassic or at the end of the Triassic and the in Triassic mass extinction. So all these tetrapod groups suffer from a sharp reduction diversity at the close of the Permian. Seventy five percent of early amphibian families and eighty percent of early reptilian families disappeared. So they took a hit, but again, that's not what we're here about. What we do know is that the synapsids bounced back to remain the dominant life forms. The mammal-like reptiles or therapsids suffered pulses of extinctions in the late Permian. The group survived the boundary crisis, but became virtually extinct by the end of the Triassic, because, uh, possibly because of competition from more efficient predators, such as the Thecodonts. But they remained the dominant species, so they act like they were just declining for 50 million years, but they weren't. They were the dominant megafauna on earth for the entire triassic and then they just suddenly started disappearing and this is before the injury i mean the in the in triassic max extinction just took them out but they were declining for some reason in the late triassic and I'll, I'll get more into that but the decline really started in the middle uh triassic and we don't know why so the first real mammals appear in the late triassic and i'm going to cover them later and then we have Creatures known as thecodonts. So thecodont, that, that used to be the assumption that thecodonts were that thecodonts were uh, the ancestors of birds. It's called the thecodont hypothesis, and that's because the uh, digit, the digit uh, organization of birds matches thecodonts instead of the non-avian dinosaurs. But then there's other finds with the uh, Manoraptorin, uh, dromaeosaurs, and stuff where they say that they're actually dinosaurs and fair enough but you you can see how you can cut things both ways so i want to go over i want to go over the extinction of the first group of th uh, therapsids that i think we really we really got to give some consideration to them so modern groups of ancestral uh, forms appear for the first time in the middle and late Triassic include Litteros turtles, uh, Rhynchocephalians, uh, which are modern Tuataras, are the only representatives, and crocodilians. But what caused the extinction of one of the most successful clades of synapsids ever? So Therocephalians, so if we look up a Therocephalian, So therocephalians are kind of like the mesopredators. They're kind of like the wolves or coyotes of the Triassic. That's a good picture of a, of a therocephalian right there. So they kind of look like this. They're kind of hairy. They assume that they're hairy. They're kind of, they kind of have some reptile features. They kind of have some mammal features. They kind of really gussy it up in the, in the fan art. But this is a good example of a therocephalian. So therocephalians were incredibly diverse. Even after the in Permian mass extinction event, they still represented a fairly dominant group of organisms that occupied niches from generalist scavengers all the way down to, oh, that's, that's a quick pick, all the way down to sort of like squirrel-like, almost Martin-esque creatures. And here we see the Therosophalin. So this is this is a good one. So the Gorgonopsids are, are considered to be closely related to the Therocephalians. But you can see they have saber teeth, they're heterodont, they're fairly sophisticated in terms of their metabolism. We think that they're capable of endothermy. And it's clear from the fossil record that these Therocephalians are very dynamic creatures. They seem very adaptable. They survived the in Permian mass extinction event along with the Lystrosaurs. And they persisted in a wide variety of environments. There's, uh, there's clear evidence that they're nothing but rugged survivalists. They're clearly rugged survivalists that honestly had a, it was it was hard to ever put them down. And we see here, like, look at these. 
So we see that they have these robust forms, these stocky skeletons. They survived all over the planet. So this is from Russia. So it says he fed on fishes and style of life is apparently similar to modern otters. So from otter-like creatures to wolf-like creatures, these animals existed. These animals existed everywhere, man. Like they, they existed all over the earth and they were inhabiting a wide variety of niches. According to natural selection, what was going to outcompete a therocephalian? What, what's, what's really going to outcompete a therocephalian? What's going to outcompete one of these dominant animals that exist in all kinds of different niches? Like what, what made them disappear? What, what made creatures like this go away? Like what was the massive impetus? And here they say this. Mass extinction of the potential to substantially alter the evolutionary trends of a clade. If new regions of ecospace are made available, the clade may radiate. If, on the other hand, the clade, clade passes through an evolutionary bottleneck by substantially reducing its species richness, then subsequent radiations may be restricted in the disparity they can they attain. Here we compare the patterns of diversity disparity uh, in the Therosophalia, a diverse lineage of amniotes that survived two mass extinction events. We use time calibrated phylogeny and discrete character data to assess microevolutionary patterns. So this diversity becomes decoupled from disparity across the impermeable mass extinction. The number of species decreases through the early Triassic and never recovers. However, while disparity briefly decreases across the extinction boundary, it recovers and remains high until the middle Triassic. What happened in the middle Triassic? What happened in the middle Triassic? They have always said, these academics have always said that the extinction debt does not work 10 million years after, if you if you start increasing in diversity again, you can't just say, oh, well, it, it, it had to limp through two mass extinctions and now it's dead. No, it, not when you have a, a, re, a, a boom, a rebirth, a, a rebirth of diversity in the clade. What, what's the, what, what was the actual impetus for their extinction in the middle Triassic? Why did the Therosophalians completely disappear in a time where there was no massive climate change and there was no massive cataclysm that occurred. They just suddenly vanished. Why did they suddenly vanish? What caused the Therosophalians to disappear off the face of the earth after they had adapted to all kinds of different ecosystems and survived this mass extinction? Well, they survived all throughout the lower, lower perm, the lower Triassic, even diversified again, had global distribution and lived in a variety of niches, and yet they all universally disappeared by the middle Triassic. So this time we're not considering the origins of, the, of an animal, we're considered its disappearance. Where did it go? So the anomadonts and cynodonts, the anomadonts lasted until the end Permian mass extinction. The cynodonts existed in a, into the Jurassic and are assumed to be the ancestors of, of modern mammals. Uh, So in Amazon, the most diverse and abundant clade of herbivores at the time, diversity and disparity were found to be decoupled with substantial loss of diversity against the e, uh, EPME, but a slow and continuous decline in disparity uh, earlier in the Permian. So they keep saying this decoupling of, of diversity, this disparity, this da 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 da. How did they survive the Permian if, if you're claiming that they were already declining? In the Permian, how how did they remain dominant? So already you see like papers like this, they just kind of talk out of their ass when it comes to um, what actually gives rise to extinction. Like they don't understand extinction, though, so they're claiming like, oh well, based on the fossils we found, we think that, and it's just all inference based nonsense because they remain dominant. the The archosaurs never really became dominant until the Jurassic period. That the age of dinosaurs really began in the Jurassic. But here we see many studies have found that species richness and disparity are not often correlated. And here they have three different articles. They have three different articles, which completely BTFO their, their assumption that, oh, if we, if we combine species richness, diversity, and disparity, uh, we can find that. But they're not always correlated. And there's three different examples where they are contradicting themselves. So this entire article they publish is contradicted almost immediately as a direct result of specialization and speciation one could expect increasing disparity early in evolutionary history um, since they diversify along ecomorphological lines in a new environment leading to quote-unquote early bursts of morphological diversity independent of species richness 
Uh, it is suggested that such decoupling can be more pronounced during periods of mass extinction, as if the extinction is non-selective uh, or targets less specialized form, disparity will, mean, will remain high while diversity falls. So all of this is basically saying nothing. Again, it's another paper where it's a bunch of word salad and they don't have a good explanation. Because remember, Ave Metatarsalians really did not diversify into the clades that we think of as mesopredatory or macropredatory. They don't know what creatures out could have outcompeted the Therosophalians for their niche. At this point in time, dinosaurs are not a thing. That might seem crazy to think about. Dinosaurs are not a thing yet. To our knowledge, dinosaurs are not, do not exist yet. And this assumption that dinosaurs outcompeted these creatures and that's why they went extinct is false. Because how are you going to outcompete something if you're not even on the playing field? It's, it's like it's like an, a baby Tom Brady. Uh, it's like I don't I don't know like I I don't want to make a sports analogy or anything I feel like that's a bit crass but it's 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 bizarre it's bizarre to blame creatures that wouldn't appear for tens of millions more years for the extinction of animals that up to that point have been doing great in the Triassic and then they just suddenly disappear in the middle Triassic with no rhyme or reason again scientists pull all this crap out of their out of out of their papers and out of their dissertations talking about oh well they, they were facing a decline in diversity and a decline in this and a decline in that but they weren't really declining they had global distribution for the variety of niches and seemed to be doing rather well for themselves all throughout the triassic until they suddenly bit the dust all over the planet and within just a few million years every single lineage of therocephalian disappeared and we don't know why and instead of just being like oh well maybe we don't know maybe we don't we don't we, we just we just don't know they they try to make all of these claims that contradict themselves and there is no clear reason why like you see that they face a decline obviously in the end permian but then you see that they increase again in diversity you see this diversity reverse itself to the early in uh, 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 phase of the lower triassic and then during the middle Triassic, for some reason, just during the course of middle Triassic, they completely drop off and disappear. Their diversity seems to recover even during the lower Triassic. They, they face a positive in increase in diversity. Look at this. During the lower Triassic, and especially here, you see the highest trends. In all figures, even this figure, which is just like it plateaus. Even here, you see that in some iterations, the model goes towards a positive trend but in none we we don't see a negative trend until the middle triassic and then for some reason they just completely drop off and die thin black line represents the diversity estimate used the maximum clade credibility tree the thin gray translucent lines indicate diversity estimated from a thousand trees drawn at random from the posterior distribution so what caused it what causes this disparity what's caused this massive drop off after we saw during the lower triassic in these three figures, we see again another nice boom in diversity of these creatures, a peak, and then they just fall off in the middle Triassic. What happened in the middle Triassic to cause this? We don't know. We find rather than a gradual increase in species riches throughout the Permian, instead a rapid increase in the latest Guadalupian. What's going on here? What, what's what's the actual what's the actual scoop on this? We see all of these different all of these different clades, all these different lineages. Where was it? So we see this: the cynodonts of low diversity during the Permian radiated in both species richness and morphological diversity in the aftermath of the extinction. The anomodonts were extremely high species richness during the Permian, but their morphological diversity had been declining since the Guadalupian. So the cynodonts had low diversity during the Permian and then radiated, apparently. The, am the anomodonts apparently did the opposite, but they survived at the end of the Triassic. They only got BTFO'd by the intriassic mass extinction. Again, it's not actually giving us a true explanation for what happened to the Therocephalians. It's like, it's like one of the 
history's biggest whodunits. What caused the Therosophalian mass extinction on a global level? Why did this entire lineage, which existed all over Pangaea, all over the planet Earth, on every corner of the planet, across all kinds of different niches, from all pine areas to, to riparian ecosystems, there were otters, there were coyotes, there were it is like if every single canid on this planet died. It's like if every canid on the Earth, every type of wolf, painted dog, jackal, coyote, dole, you name it, if they all just went extinct. If they all just randomly disappeared for, and, and we just didn't know why. There, there's no real explanation given for this. And yet again, we're being given these clean cut explanations for why species disappear, why species emerge. And it all has to do with natural selection. It all has to do with what traits get passed on and which animals are best adapted to their ecosystem. But we see right here, right here, the Therosophalians are proof that you could be as perfectly adapted to your ecosystem as you can be, and you could still die out universally. You could be a, a, a Lystrosaur, nothing but a big, chunky, beefy, generalist omnivore, not specially adapted at all. And what do you know? Global distribution across all kinds of habitats because you just happen to be the one that survived. I mean, it's pretty incredible to me. I mean, there are examples where natural selection may not actually be all it's cooked up to be. It may, it, there may be more to what species live and die than just natural selection. And there may be more to this than just luck of the draw or whatever. It seems that there's distinct patterns enigmatic patterns that don't clearly fit within a macroevolutionist mindset as to what species live and die in nature. Just because you're perfectly adapted to your ecosystem and you're diverse and you seem to be doing well and radiating well, a trend can reverse itself. And they don't have a fancy pants mass extinction because other clades are doing fine at this time. They don't have a fancy pants mass extinction to point to. They don't have some new predator or mesopredator coming onto the scene to point to. So what happened? And they all die of disease? It's What happened? They don't know. Again, they just don't know. And yet they make up all of this word salad about decoupling and whoop-de-whoop. -whoop, but they don't have an explanation for why the Therosophalians went extinct. They don't have a smoking gun. And yet this entire macroevolutionary principle only makes sense when you talk about turnover, when you talk about competition, when you talk about survival of the fittest. And yet sometimes we see from the fossil record that has nothing to do with why species go extinct. It has nothing to do with how species emerge. And yet people continually show this like it's the truth, like it is irrefutable. And yet we see right here that in just 10 million years, one of the most successful lineages of any animal ever to exist just went extinct. Small generalists, highly specialized, doesn't matter. These tiny well-adapted, survivalist, therosophalians universally died out in the middle Triassic with no explanation, no reason, no impetus given. Oh, well, who knows? Stay in school, kids. The last thing I want to cover, of course, is the absolute lack of evidence Again, we talked about why species go extinct. We talked about what causes an animal to emerge. We've talked about base mutation rated reptiles and birds. Where did dinosaurs come from? That was like the, one of the biggest themes that I kind of like alluded to back in the lower Triassic extreme. But this time I want to kind of cover the Ave Metatarsalian. So Ave Metatarsalia. So Ave Metatarsalia includes all of these different archosaurs. So according to the Wikipedia, if we go down here, this is a good diagram. So this is like the ankle bone of the Ave Metatarsalians. The foundational characteristic is the advanced metatarsal ankles, which are characterized by a large um, astrag uh, astragalus, astragalus or talus bone. I just call it the talus bone. I, I Sometimes I hate word salad or letter salad and a small calcanium. The ankle orientation is operating on a single hinge, allowing for better more mobility. Probably as a result of this change, the common ancestor had been um, had had an upright bipedal posture with the legs extending vertically, similar to that of mammals. So again, we don't know where they came from. Origin, birdline ancestors appear 
uh, in the Ancien stage of the Middle Triassic, about 245 million years ago, represented by the dinosaur form Acillosaurus. I covered Acillosaurus last time. So Acillosaurus, keep in mind, remember this. So this is the reason I went to the Wikipedia, because this is like the first thing people will see. I hate Wikipedia, uh, but this is something I really want to point out, because this is something that I see everywhere. It doesn't matter if it's from Wikipedia, wherever. I'll show you uh, an, an actual article. I covered a Acillosaurus last time. First and foremost, we don't. There's multiple traits with the Acillosaurus that are not dinosaur, dinosaur-like, and can't be alluded to dinosaurs or crocodilians. That's why it's called a dinosaur form. It's in the form of a dinosaur. It's similar to dinosaurs, but is not considered a crown group dinosaur. The thing about a Acillosaurus, though, is that's our earliest proof of an Ave Metatarsalian that we know of. The bird line archosaurs, these um, Ave Metatarsalians that seem to be the closest related to dinosaurs and birds are fully derived, fully specialized, and diverse, appearing all over the world in the middle Triassic with no known ancestor. Keep this in mind. So footprints may belong to the more primitive dinosaur morph, but 249 million years ago is the origin, they think the origin of Abimanotarsalians, but this incredibly derived ankle shape, they talk about these footprints, but this is what I want to lead to, this incredibly derived lineage of animals with complicated upright posture, with possible mesothermy or even endothermy that have specialized diets, specialized lifestyles already supposedly appeared in the middle Triassic out of thin air. Again, just like the anurans, just like the corals, we see this radiation of animals, these, some of the most important animals ever to exist and the animals that we put into the same group as birds today, and we don't know their origins. That is where we assume they come from. Our earliest dinosauriform is a creature that is already highly specialized. It isn't like we discovered a lizard and then we discovered a slightly bigger lizard with, it's like, we don't have any clear, concise, definitive specimens that we can say these dinosaurs derive from. We just have a bunch of dinosaur forms. We have some kangaroo looking lizards that we think might be a dinosaur form, but we don't know. The first definitive Albimetatarsalian is a highly specialized, omnivorous, maybe meso herbivorous animal that was already fully integrated in its ecosystem. We don't have this Eohippus to Equus transition that these macroevolutionists want. We just see that dinosaurs more or less, especially Abimanotarsalians, more or less just appear in the middle Triassic. Just like the frogs, just like the squamates, which, I mean, you could say like, oh, this earlier diapsid lizard is the ancestor of squamates. Easy cop out, but just like turtles, just like frogs, just like stony corals, dinosaurs appeared like a thunderclap in the middle Triassic in just 10 million years you go from there's no dinosaurs to now we have dinosaur forms with no clear explanation, with no clear lineages of descent, no descent with modification here, no natural selection causing my anamorph shape shifting, just straight up there wasn't dinosaurs before. And now we have dinosaur forms that are already highly specialized with specialized morphology, unlike any other archosaur we've seen before. And now they're here. And even then, it's like we see these uh, archosaur forms come about. They immediately radiate. They immediately start shape shifting into all kinds of different forms and speciating into different lineages. And by the end of the Triassic, you have flying pterosaurs, and you have dominant predators, and you have it's like the age of the age of dinosaurs. I mean, it's miraculous, but in the time it took for again, it's just tens of millions of years. It can seem a bit miraculous, doesn't it? Like when you're getting pterosaurs and you're like fully flying powered flight and you're getting ocean going giant marine reptiles you have ichthyosaurs you have uh you you have these um the last you have even prosauropods like the platyosaurs you have hererosaurs you have eoraptors coelophysis all these dinosaurs and all these marine mammals and all these flying reptiles i want to get into and they're all archosaurs. They're, they all appeared in just a couple tens of millions of years. And their ultimate origin even is completely and utterly unknown. The tempo triassic dinosaur radiation is central to long-standing debates about dinosaurian success. 
Triassic mass extinction, the establishment of quote unquote modern ecosystems, the earliest phase of radiation followed the diversions of the dinosaur stem lineage. Um, so dinosaur morpha, so it includes pterosaurs and crocodilomorphs, is poorly understood. They say it right there, poorly understood. What they mean by poorly understood is that they don't know, that it's a complete mystery, and yet they continue to shill this, I, this narrative like they have this beautiful mosaic of how everything diverged from a common ancestor. They want to convince us that everything has a common ancestor, but can't even explain the origins of some of the most important creatures on this planet. Again, this is the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth paper in a row where we hear, we see these words is poorly understood. In fact, I, I wish I could take this and, and put it on a plaque. I wish I could put it under e each and every paper that I like control F and highlight poorly is poorly understood. I see the phrase is poorly understood in almost every paper I've covered so far. And it's just ridiculous that these people want to create this alternative religion for the secular masses. And yet I don't, I don't know anywhere in any religious text, any Abrahamic texts like the, the Torah, Bible, Quran, or any Hindu Veda. I don't know any like writings of Confucius or the spring and autumn poetry. I don't know any Heian period court document writings or, uh, or, or you know, poetry uh, sayings, Buddhist philosophy, whatever, whatever religious text you can possibly think of where the phrase is poorly understood or anything of that akin is really actually stated on as constant of a basis and about as foundational of things as, as these people do. And yet they want to sit on a pulpit and say that, oh yeah, we have all the answers. Because my issue isn't that. It's like you you can if you wanna if you wanna believe that, then fine. It's like people are entitled to their own religious beliefs. But I'm sick of them acting like it's scientific to say this, that it's somehow objective to say this. If you want to be a materialist and have this be your religion, I will uh, go ahead, be be my guest. I don't care. But my issue comes with the fact that you try to act like you're being objective and you're being scientific and you're being rational and empiricist. But again, time after time after time, paper after paper, you completely write out of your ass. You don't know what you're actually talking about. And yet you keep trying to promote a theory. You keep trying to promote an ideology that is not actually grounded in science. You admit that there's all of these holes, all of these uh, lack of attention to detail, all of these uh, gaps in your data that exist and you don't have any idea about even the most foundational aspects of what your philosophy is trying to promote. You're trying to say everything that comes from a single common ancestor and that lizards come, uh, that uh, frogs come from fish and that fish gave rise to all, all, like we're all technically fish. We're all technically lungfish. And those lungfish defended, descended from uh, what brachiostoma and those brachiostoma descended from worms and those worms descended from some jellyfish crawling on the seafloor and that like little bilaterian jellyfish thing on the seafloor is uh, just a clump of cells that started working together and that goes back to the first cell that uh, arrived on a hydrothermal vent that got zapped with radiation it's just like they unironically want you to believe this crap and the only way you'll ever believe it is if they try to disguise it with all of this ethos and all this academic hubris and oh spend 12 years in school and we'll feed you a, a a bed of lies and just this, the, the most insane theory about the origins of life on earth and all of it, just because they're, they have like sky daddy issues or something like they, they resent religion so much, or they just want to create their own religion personally, because it's an agenda. And I, as I've said before, I, I'm not making this series because I have any bone in the fight. I'm, I'm making this series because there is a clear, concise agenda based on what they want you to believe it's propaganda, not science. And it's an alternative religion. They want you to believe in this rather than any other uh, preconceived notion or idea or theory about the universe. They don't want you to genuinely keep an open mind about the origins of life and where we all come from. They want you to believe what they're spewing and they want you to believe it blindly and without any further explanation besides, oh, we have some ideas. So they have all of this evidence, all this data they present to you but then conveniently ignore all the places where they don't have data. It's like positive reinforcement, but they don't want to actually point out the holes in their theories. So, so ghost lineages cannot currently bear on the timing or pace of dinosaur morph origins, despite indicating an early Triassic origin for archosaurs more broadly. 
Surprisingly, foots, footprints are often ignored source of data in this debate. Although trace fossils are often more important than body fossils, that's because when you're dealing with footprints, you don't know what creates those footprints. When you have a single three-toed or four-toed footprint, anything can make that footprint. You don't know how flesh is distributed on the foot of a synapsid versus a diapsid in the early Triassic. We don't have uh, fresh tissue preservation. So they assume they have ghost lineages of dinosaur morph origins, assume they have an early Triassic origin, but there's no evidence for it. There's no origin animal for the archosaurs. There's no least common ancestor for the archosaurs. They appear fully, fully derived and diverged with the Psilosaurus, and we don't have anything earlier than Psilo, um, a Psilosaurus that is definitively an archosaur. The first Ave Metatarsalian is a derived, mostly herbivorous, upright, mesothermic, if not endothermic, terrestrial land animal about the size of a, of a small deer. Not this scurrying little lizard from with, from with humble origins. It's like if you're trying to piece together the origin of mammals and all you have is like, it's like, oh yeah, this is our earliest uh, mammal specimen. And all you have to offer is like an elk or something. It's, it's, it's bizarre. It's like if you have a sheep and you're like, okay, this is the uh, earliest mammal we got, fam. It's like... Seriously, like, like, not like a, like a, like, I would assume it looked like a squirrel or something like a monkey. It's like, nope, it's a sheep. You got a sheep. I'm like, so your, your earliest mammal goes back to a sheep. Yep. Yep. It's a sheep. Take it early. We, we assume that there had to be something more primitive than the sheep, like, you know, a few million years back. But for now, all we got is this sheep, bam. Which is kind of what they did with whales. Let's be honest. They, they went to Pachycetus and like, yeah. Whales come from squirrels, but they they can't do the same thing with dinosaurs. They can't, you know, rewind the clock and say that squirrels, uh, <laughs> that that uh, people come from squirrels or something. Um, they they oh, the earliest dinosaur dinosaur morph that they have is a, is a silvosaurus. So it's kind of funny. So they they say the footprints of possible early members are reported from several sites around the world, uh, and have been described as substantially predating dinosaur morph body fossils which are first known from the middle Triassic. So 242 to 244 million years ago. So that, the, when they say the first known from the middle Triassic, this is the Acillosaurus, the derived specialized uh, Acillosaurus. So many of these interpretations are quote unquote controversial because, because of poor preservation and uncertain age and stratigraphic correlations. What this means is that it's cope and see. They can't properly date it. They don't know if they're actually belonging to archosaur morphs whatsoever. And I mean, wow, uncertain age and stratigraphic correlations. That means that they don't even know if the rock layers that they're in even correlate to the early Triassic. <laughs> they don't even know which rock layer they're actually in. So how can you make any definitive conclusions beyond what even made the, the trace fossil? They don't even know which actual rock layer it's in. <laughs> the, the actual... And this is these are the two sources, Reptile and Amphibian Trackways in the Moncopi Formation of Arizona and Utah. And the other paper that points it out is Potential for Biochronology of Triassic Continental Sequences. Both of these papers point out the fact that there's um, certain issues with how they actually dated the fossils ge uh, geologically that even go beyond just like what made it. So they don't even know if these supposed uh, evident, uh, these trace fossils are even from the early Triassic, which is kind of hilarious. So... Uh, because a rigorous synapomorphy based approach for identifying track marks and differentiated potential dinosaur morph prints from those of other reptiles is infrequently used. So what this means is that um, a definitive guide on actually differentiating what unique traits. So the synapomorphy is a shared trait that um, emerges. It's a derived trait in a lineage that separates it from other, from other clades. So for example, a synapomorphy of, Let's say, let's say birds versus other dinosaurs is uh, as, or manoraptors would be, let's say like, I don't know, the fusing of, of their digits, their, their second and third digit of their, of their hands, the fusing of those digits. Uh, we could see that with early Evolians. So I know the intent, um, intent or ornithids and the true Aves both have the trait of the fused digit, but then they don't have the claw except in like Watsons or something. So like you could point out like, oh, this is a, a synapomorphy or a plesiomorphy of birds. It's just any derived trait that emerges in a clade or lineage. 
that isn't shared with a common ancestor and the other related sister taxa. So it's a synapomorphy. Uh, so trying to identify track marks based on those is difficult. Differentiating potential dinosaur morph traits and those of other rep, uh, reptiles is infrequently used. So again, you don't know if the tracks you're seeing come from a dinosaur morph, come from a squamate, come from a testudine, come from any other type of early reptile that was around at this time. You don't know if it's, this is a rhynchocephalian or an archosaur. So again, who knows? As a result, footprints are often ignored or largely dismissed by workers focusing on body fossils and are rarely marshaled as evidence in macroevolutionary studies of dinosaur radiation. And why would they? Again, you don't know what's actually leaving the track mark. How are you going to say that, okay, this is evidence that dinosaurs uh, descended from lizards, but you don't actually have the lizard. All you have is a track that could belong to any type of lizard. And we know at this time by the early tri uh, middle Triassic that true squamates have emerged. So you can't say like, oh, well, this is the ancestor of, of dinosaurs because it's probably likely that it's not the ancestor of dinosaurs. If we're already seeing that true squamates and test students are emerging at this time, you might just be looking at a rhynchocephalian or squamate or stem, you know, rhynchocephalian or squamate and not a true archosaur because archosaurs by the middle Triassic were already fairly di uh, divergent and specialized, already fairly diverse. You can't just say like, oh, they descended from a lizard from just 10 million years back. It's kind of a difficult sell. Uh, so recent discoveries have placed a Polish Jurassic record key to understand the ascent of dinosaurs. So this, this, so this animal Silesia, from Silesia is an acylosaur. It's called Silosaurus, and I covered it. It's actually in the thumbnail of my previous critique. So this is what they're talking about. This basal dinosaur morph from the middle, late Carnian stage of Silesia is Celosaurus, and that's a dinosaur morph, not a true dinosaur. Again, very derived and already on the scene. So here we see dinosaur morph tracks, alleged dinosaur morph tracks. And again, they still only get to the middle Triassic. We don't have them any earlier than the middle Triassic. So even these trace fossils only date to the middle Triassic. They don't go any earlier. So we see this is the middle Triassic, this is the early Triassic, and we see these tiny footprints. What we can definitively say is one of their tracks comes from the middle Triassic. These tracks right here from these much smaller creatures, much more difficult cell. This could come from a, this could potentially come from a wide variety of different animals. Um, but they think that these trace fossils might belong to a dinosaur morph. Might. And these are the, these are the same tracks. Again, four digits clawing through the mud could belong to any sort of reptile. This could belong to a rhynchocephalian, squamate, or early archosaur. There is no definitive proof either way. So early middle Triassic, Holy Cross Mountains of southern Poland, Prorotodactylus um, from early Olin Canyon of, not going to pronounce that, um, trackway composed of imprints. So It's hard to say. They think it's protodactylus, but again, with trace fossils, you never actually know. Without a body fossil to go along with it, you don't know if the trace fossil is definitively that animal. You don't know if it's an animal you haven't discovered yet that is still in the fossil record. You don't know if it's just another animal. We don't. You don't even know if the actual animal you're studying would even walk the way you're assuming it's going to walk. Uh, the the animal that you might uh, have. It, I mean, what if the animal walks? Degenerate. What if the animal is plantigrade? What if, uh, okay, the footprints match up, but what if it didn't walk like that? You have evidence later on that it did. So, so the tracks is the two important fe features that corroborate the referral to Lagerpedon, like dinosaur, um, like dinosaur morph, and differentiate them from other common Triassic taxa. First, the three central digits are essentially parallel, with interdigital angles less than 10 degrees on average. And in those rare, very deep press imprints that are preserved traces of metatarsals, all metatarsal pads are united and form a single compact unit. But do you have enough body fossils from the early Triassic to rule out that it's a dinosaur morph or not a dinosaur morph? Again, that's what people are saying is the issue with this, is you don't have enough proof to clearly and distinctly say this is a unique synapomorphy solely to this clade. Having three parallel central digits does not tell you much. And even then, you can kind of see how that's a bit problematic as well. Like you can interpret this 
for yourself, are these completely parallel? Are these truly parallel central digits? There seems to, there seems to be some, I mean, they, they definitely are somewhat parallel. They say essentially parallel. And the devil's in the details. What does it mean to be essentially parallel? They're, again, tough sell, less than 10 degree angles on average. So second, the posterior margin of the footprint is straight, which is indicative of a bunched metatarsus and a foot acting as a single structure instead of a series of splay digits as shown by bio uh, biomechanical simulations. A bunched metatarsus is a synapomorphy of ave, ave metatarsalia, and then your parallel central digits are unique to Lagerpadon. But do you know this for sure? Are you sure that no other lineage of reptiles in the early Triassic could possibly possess these traits? Again, the, you're, it's almost like a law case. You're trying to remove all reasonable doubt that this is the animal in question. Is there any reasonable doubt to assume that this trace fossil could belong to another animal? This is why trace fossils aren't used. And, and they even said themselves, this is why most trace fossils are overlooked by macroevolutionist principles, because even to these macroevolutionists, it's not strong enough evidence to sell your horse on. You can't just walk in and say like, oh, well, these footprints kind of look like they belong to an Ave Meditarsali. And there's, you know, they, 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 they look like they check out. It's not good enough. It's really not good enough. You don't know how footprints are going to manifest themselves. You can say like, oh, well, it looks like the way they walk, it, it assumes a bunch of metatarsis, but you're assuming the bunch of metatarsis. You can't just say this animal had a bunch of metatarsis without having the metatarsis there. You're making up evidence out of thin air. It's like you're you're taking a small fraction of evidence and then assuming a body of evidence and then drawing for that body of evidence to make a conclusion. It's like it, it's like going to the store and trying to buy an apple and having a salesman like, oh, do you want to buy some apples? I'm like, you know what? You know, it's very interesting. Uh, you know, Satan tried to try to give Eve an apple and or make the meat from the tree of good and evil. And he handed him fruit, just like you're handing me a fruit. Are you the devil? It's like it's the same line of thought. It's the same. It's the same line of questioning to to take such a minor detail, such a such a fragmentary piece of evidence and trying to blow it up and make it fit into your theory instead of trying to be as objective as possible. Are there aspects of the, of the specimen that don't match up to Ave Metatarsalians? It's like you always focus on the things that match up to your theory. You never focus on the things that dispel it. And in empirical science, you have to focus on what doesn't work out. You have to disprove the haters. You have to, you have to make this assumption with as very little doubt as possible. So rhynchosauroids, which are superficially similar to Prodactylus, have more splayed central digits. But do all of them, have you found the entire corpus of rhynchosauroides to say that they have more splayed digits universally and more curved posterior margins? That these tracks all, also lack other synapomorphies of Archosauria, Abomanotarsalia, and Dinosauromorpha, including narrow gauge trackways and a jittergrade posture. So interesting. They also, that so again, they have to admit here, there's other things that don't add up. Importantly, parallel central digits and straight posterior margin are seen in all specimens of Perorodactylus, uh, regardless of substrate, and are absent on rhynchosauroids tracks preserved in the same slabs, indicating these are not artifacts of preservation, but rather genuine morphological features of the track maker. Do you have enough physical evidence of tracks besides the tracks that you just have to make that conclusion though? Do you have the entire corpus of rhynchosauroids to come to that conclusion? Or are you just basing it off the data you have as of right now? Because if you are, then these are very grandiose assumptions that can get BTFO'd any day that we come out with more information on this. So the oldest known tracks of dinosaur morph lineage. So the oldest evidence we have dinosaur morph in lineage. So let's say these are dinosaur morphs. Even then, the oldest evidence we have just comes from... Five million years prior. Oh, I mean, now you see, now you see why it can be so difficult to deal with these academics. You see how it can be so difficult to kind of like sit down and think critically about these 
these problems because when you actually look at them objectively and you try to look at what are these people saying to justify their stances? What are these people claiming to back up their theories? What is the evidence for what they're saying? These people want to sell you on the idea that all life descends from a common ancestor, that all these, that we have it all figured out, that we know, generally speaking, where lineages go and where they come from. And yet they can't answer basic, fundamental questions about the history of life on Earth. The Middle Triassic alone punches massive holes in much of the theory of evolution. In much of this macroevolutionist dogma, the Middle Triassic alone presents them with mystery after mystery after mystery that they can't explain. Animals randomly appearing out of thin air, the same you know, creatures that they're saying are fundamental to the modern day and are key to understand the universe. We don't know where they came from. Simultaneously, some of those diverse clades on Earth, without any evidence of competition with any specific animal group, any real mass extinction meteor volcanism or habitat conversion to pin on them, go extinct. They disappear. It's the almost exact opposite phenomenon. Animals appear, animals go away. And your th neat little theories about natural selection and mutation just don't add up. They just don't add up. They don't, they don't actually bear any real substantial fruit because you're so obsessed with trying to justify your ideology. You can't sit down and be humble enough to say, you're, like these people are grasping at straws to, to give them an earlier date than the middle Triassic. They, they don't want it. They want to find some evidence, some olive branch, some life raft to to hang on because they don't want us they don't want to say all we have all we have is this already derived acillosaurus they they desperately want the dinosaurs to be from some permian stock the archosaurs uh, appeared um in this gradual progress they they want to find a more primitive form they can't just convince people that an acillosaurus climbed out of the pond scum they have to find the earlier lineage. They have to find the common ancestor. They have to find that smoking gun and they can't find it. They, they want to point to some obscure tracks from Poland and manipulate and contrive the data as much as possible to make it fit their narrative, but they don't have much to go off of. So in these final minutes, I'm going to kind of just go over where this, where this entire thing is going from here. We're going to actually go deep onto dinosaurs for the last part of the Triassic critique because this is the last phase this is when the the dicynodonts and the other therapsids their heyday starts to come to an end you have the intrastic mass extinction the age of dinosaurs but you finally have the first real dinosaurs and crocodilomorphs coming to the fore you you have the again you have small glimpses glimpses of what the modern world's going to look like from earlier periods, but this is really when the age of dinosaurs starts to really kick off, where dinosaurs start to diverge and shape shift into all kinds of different forms that we see today, where you have a huge corpus of ongoing research. It's exciting. It's a lot. So my next stream is probably going to be continuing my Xenome Biology series. I'm going to talk about terraforming on, I think, either ocean worlds or or dead worlds or something i'm, I'm going to focus on uh trying to branch out on xenobiology and then after that i think i'm going to go back to this critique wrap up the upper triassic which is most of the triassic by the way like three quarters of the triassic is actually upper triassic the middle triassic is just 10 million years and the reason it's 10 million years is because it's incredibly important uh for the history of life on earth and a lot happens during it, but most of the Triassic is actually the upper Triassic, and that is going to involve um, a fair amount of research. So I'm going to try to pump that out again sooner rather than later. I hope that I don't spend the entire summer having to research this, but either way, I wanted to get this cranked out. I wanted to pump this out. And to those who uh, are new to the channel or who have maybe stumbled upon this as my most recent upload, feel free to join the squad. I'll try to um, stream on the weekends sometime, but I'll, I I didn't put out a notification this time. I thought I'd just randomly stream it. Again, I might just re-upload this 
as a standalone video. But again, if you're new, please subscribe, leave a like or comment, and I'll catch you guys next time. Hopefully not next month, but hope <laughs> we'll see. Either way, I'm still here. I'm still kicking, and my critiques aren't going to stop until the you know heat death of the universe. So as long as these scientists keep acting like idiots, you'll keep hearing from me. All right, guys, take care.